Hello everyone, so welcome back. Um, in our previous uh, videos, uh, we talk about the unemployment topics. So today we are going to um, uh, cover a little bit more about the inflation uh, topics that we discussed in the previous chapter. Um, so uh, many of you should have known that um, the GDP inflation rate uh, Unemployment; those are the very important macroeconomic uh, indicator in our study, especially in uh, the U.S. Uh, governments. Um, there are always two groups of people uh, in our governments that it's fighting. Um, maybe one is more important um, to the other ones uh, when they are trying to come up with a policy. For instance, um, in the Fed, the Federal Reserve, um, there are two groups of people. One is called the hawks, and the other group is called the doves. Um, the hawks are usually the one that actually supports um, uh, the uh, indicator of inflation would be more important um, to evaluate the current state of economy. So whenever the inflation rate go out of hand, um, they would like to actually suggest to make changes of the uh, policy. Well, on the other hand, the doves um, actually argue that um, the economy is actually uh, uh, more federal um, if the uh, employment is actually not high. So they are the group that supports uh, more on uh, looking at the unemployment rates um, to form their policy um, tools to adjust for the current state of economy. Well, and un unfortunately, later in our macro model, we are going to um, study how um, the unemployment rate and inflation cannot be controlled at the same time. And that's the reason why we call them the two great evils in macro macroeconomic study. So the two principal goals of uh, macroeconomic policy are, um, number one, trying to lower the unemployment rate, and the other one would be the price stability. However, um, most of the time when we're dealing with one problem, let's say unemployment, uh, we are trying to um, take a policy to reduce the unemployment in the economy. Uh, we usually will be out of uh, our control for the price level. If um, the inflation is going too high or maybe going into deflation, uh, we're trying to put it back to the uh, normal range. Um, unfortunately, unemployment uh, will be our trade-off might actually, uh, in some instance, uh, we might not um, uh, be able to control the unemployment at a low level. But later we're gonna see more example and um, how the theoretical model suggests. But for now, we basically just say that, well, the two cannot um, um, achieve um, at the same time, unfortunately, in most cases. Well, just a quick review, uh, because we went through this in the class, um, just want to remind you how, uh, what do we mean by inflation. So to calculate the inflation, basically we use the price index. Uh, we're taking the percentage change of the two uh, periods price, in, price index and um, put it into a very simple equations like the following. Um, let's say if you're using um, the consumer price index, you can use the current period's consumer price index number minus the previous period's consumer price index number and divided by the previous period's uh, consumer price index and multiply by 100%. <clears throat> when you get a positive number, this is what we call the inflation in the economy. If you get a negative number, when the price index actually um, decrease uh, compared to the previous periods, then uh, we are going to uh, experience uh, what we call the deflation. Well, I think uh, at this point, uh, most of you guys should have um, some sort of idea why inflation might not be a good thing, um, and also why do we care about the cost of living. Um, but in general, um, I think it's also true that uh, whenever um, there is a change in prices, um, not only the prices will change, but sometimes your, your, your wages may also change. Um, in a very extremely simple um, um, economic um, circular flow diagram um, that we studied before. Let's say we only assume the economy has um, 
some households. Let's say in this case, we have three people working and um, we have the firms who are producing the products. Let's say they are producing car. If um, the firm actually produce uh, 300 units of car, let's say three cars that they produce, each one is $100 and they need to hire three people to produce it. Um, and this circular flow diagram basically uh, suggests that, hey, every um, consumption or spending in the economy will ultimately flow back to the um, households as um, the wages or maybe the profits. Now the question is, what if we actually have the uh, price of uh, the price of the car actually increase dramatically? So instead of one hundred unit uh, one hundred dollar per units. Now we have the car actually charge $10,000 per unit. So now the firm is making a sales of three cars in the economy, which uh, will cost people $30,000 to buy. But as you can see, well, when the firm making profits or money, they are actually getting more money returned from um, selling their products. Uh, this revenue, uh, partial of the revenue, will ultimately go back to um, the owner of the firm, which is the households, and uh, the money that will be spent on producing the car, which is the labor that the firm hired, or the capital that the firm used to produce the car, uh, will ultimately again fall back to the hands of the households. So in this case, well, the total income of each worker uh, produced the three cars will receive $10,000 each uh, in returns. So in this example, uh, we are trying to demonstrate um, maybe the cost of living um, it's very important to us but at the same time we might need to also um, um, compare it to what our income uh, has changed over time and one particular uh, concept that we would like to clarify here is um, to take a look at this um, terminology here um, to get a sense of um, what we mean by the real number and the nominal uh, uh, numbers. So we have a study about the GDP. We know the GDP can be defined in two terms, the real GDP and nominal GDP. The real GDP is the one that adjusts uh, for the price change. And um, in terms of uh, wages, income, and interest rate, indeed, we also have uh, the same um, terminology that attach with each of this variable. So for instance, when we talk about wages, uh, we can actually define what we mean by uh, real wages and nominal wages, uh, real income, nominal income, and real interest rate and nominal interest rate. And all the real variables that we define here basically refer to um, the same concept. It's basically the wage, the income, and the interest rate that adjusts for um, any change of the prices. So let's give a very quick example here so you can actually um, get a sense of like what we mean by real wages. So for instance, let's suppose uh, we have a person in the economy. Uh, his name is Winston. And Winston um, actually received an annual salary of $30,000 in the year of 2000. 15 years later, he is now actually earning $50,000 uh, in 2015. So 30,000 is what he made um, in 2000, and 50,000 is what he is uh, making in the year of 2015. And um, we would like to ask the questions um, Does Winston actually having a higher income compared to uh, what he earns in the year of 2000? So after 15 years, is uh, Winston actually um, getting um, a higher quality of life? with these higher wages. Um, by looking at the number here, obviously, um, Winston is actually making more money. Right? So uh, the $50,000, it's definitely uh, far more than $30,000. But again, those uh, salary or wages um, or income that we um, seen here, it's what we call the nominal wages or nominal income. So this number is nominal because it's not just or any price changes in the economy. So you can simply arise to questions. So when Winston actually making $30,000 in the year of 2000, um, how much uh, does he pay for his, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, 
、uh, data plans, or maybe how much he is paying for、uh, pizza,、um, comparing to when Winston is actually making a fifty thousand dollar income in two thousand fifteen, and how much he is paying for his、um, same data plans. Um, and also buying the same pizza in the year of 2015, and obviously the answer will be very different because、um, the prices of the overall goods、um, actually change dramatically、uh, during this time periods. So in order to um, um, come up with a number that we can compare across time, we have to turn this、um, nominal wages、um, into a real wages or real variable. So in order to do that,、uh, we actually need two more、um, informations here. So、uh, what we need is the CPI in both years. So let's say in the year of 2000,、uh, we have the CPI equals to 174, and in the year of 2015, we have the CPI equals to、uh, 233. The way how we're going to do it is basically either bring the wages、um, from the future periods back to the previous periods. Compare, or the other way around to bring the previous wages back to the、uh, current periods to compare to the current values. So I'm going to use this example. We are trying to bring the wages that Winston earned in the year of 2000 back into the value in 2015, so that we can see how much that $30,000 Winston earned in 2000、uh, will worth. In the year of 2015, so we can actually do a head-to-head -head comparison. But the, we,、uh, the 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 equations that we are going to use here, it's pretty simple. So in order to turn the money、uh, from the past to the future, we are going to use the value in the past, multiply by the CPI in the current periods, and divide by the CPI in that particular、uh, periods in the past. So that's basically the equation we're going to use, and we have all this number, and all we need to do is just plug in. Now we are bringing the thirty thousand dollar Winston、um, actually earned in two thousand to the year of two thousand fifteen values,、um, so that we can compare them head to head. And the approximate、uh, income here, the salary that we get is forty thousand eight hundred sixty two dollars. So、um, in this case,、um, now this number it's what we call the real wages in the year of 2000、um, using the 2015、uh, dollar price、uh, points. So just like how we calculate the、uh, price index and G、uh, real GDP,、um, we are basically treating、um, the year of 2000 in this case as our base year, and keeping the base year price、um, the values of Thirty thousand dollar bring to the year two thousand fifteen will work forty thousand dollar and eight hundred sixty two dollar. So、um, in this case, now we can compare the number to the、uh, salary that Vincent earned in two thousand fifteen. And obviously, Vincent is doing much better in the year of two thousand fifteen as compared to、uh, the year of two thousand. Regardless,、uh, we seen this very big、uh, dramatic increase in. Uh, the price index or inflations. Now the thing is,、um, even though we can talk about the real wages, right? We can understand the purchasing power of your money、um, through different time periods by adjusting the prices,、um, but it doesn't really mean that. Well, when the inflation goes up,、um, your wages or your real wages、uh, will immediately jump、uh, by exactly the same amount. And to be a little bit more precise, most of the time, like、uh, it will be uh, 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 the reverse case of what you see in Winston、um, in the example. Most of the time,、uh, the overall prices actually rises、um, a lot more faster than our nominal wages. So that、um, when we trying to、um, uh, think about our income,、uh, we are actually、uh, can only afford to buy less comparing to the previous period. So the rates of the nominal wages、um, usually are not going to be as fast as the inflations, but、um, is this、um, something that we concern? Like, what is the true cost of the inflations in general? So in this case,、um, you might want to think about 
Is it really true when everything is getting more expensive and that's the social cost to our life? Um, again, well, in most cases, um, we know wages and prices will adjust at the same time. Wages may not be adjusting as fast as the overall prices in the economy, but most of the time we are getting pretty close to it, not getting too far away. So when things are getting more expensive and at the same time our wages will also rise, so this is not something that we majorly concern. However, one thing that we concern uh, about is when the overall wages adjust to the inflations. Um, some people in the economy might actually get the adjustments um, uh, to uh, the magnitude change in inflations. Like inflation goes up by 2% and your, uh, your nominal wages also goes up by 10%, then you are basically catching up. However, um, as you can imagine, there are many people in um, the country might not have the uh, adjustments as um, accurately uh, to the change of inflation. So when inflation goes up by 2%, but your wages only adjust by 0.5%, then, well, in this case, you are actually losing your purchasing power. So um, the social cost that um, we can imagine for from uh, inflations could be because of the um, uh, the distributions of the income change might not be uh, uh, equally uh, distributed to the populations. So some people might actually get uh, more adjustments um, to inflation, and some people might actually get a very, very low um, um, increase of wages uh, to the change of inflation. But there are more concern about the inflation here uh, than what we thought. For instance, when we actually know that inflation is coming, and this is the time when people actually start taking actions and reacting, um, unfortunately, um, this somehow will pose a social cost to um, this economy. And there are three main types of social costs that we usually uh, refer to. Number one is called the shoes leather cost. The shoes leather cost basically refer to um, the people like regular households when they actually concerned about this high inflation period coming and they know it's coming and they would like to actually make adjustments. Um, so for example, they might actually need to go um, to every single bank to um, investigate well, which one would be a good saving account to earn the highest interest to get um, to uh, basically ensure they have a equal uh, purchasing power in the future period. Um, some people will be spending uh, uh, huge amounts of time to basically look for investment tool like um, buying a stock or maybe making uh, mutual funds, um, maybe uh, buying uh, treasury bonds from the government. So they will have to go everywhere to look around and um, spending their efforts to save the money. Um, this is a very uh, old-fashioned term because uh, shoes leather cost basically in uh, implies that the people in the past, they actually run around and they actually wear out their uh, leather shoes uh, much faster than a uh, normal day when there is no, uh, not much of a high inflation uh, uh, to their life. And number two, it's what we call the manual cost. So the manual cost is usually uh, referred to the social cost uh, from the firm side. So the firm also pose uh, uh, cost uh, when they are facing uh, inflation. Uh, in the future period. Uh, for instance, um, when firms know that well, the inflation is going to happen very frequently, um, it forces them to also change their um, prices on the menu a lot more frequent than before. Um, and they have to uh, constantly making adjustment to the wages of the labor, they have to constantly making changes of the prices of the menu, um, which pose a social cost to the firm to run the business. And the third one here, it's called the unit of account cost. Um, this is an example you can find in the world right now. Um, hopefully uh, you'll remember we talk about the example in Venezuela. So the problem of unit of account cost is when the people start um, losing faith uh, to their own currency, 
when they actually feel like, well, their own currency is getting uh, less and less reliable, they do not want to use their own currency to uh, exchange for goods and services. Um, with this um, uh, uh, unit of account cost, it's definitely going to reduce um, the total quantity of transactions in the economy and also the quality of the economic decisions. So when people um, start losing faith or start not trusting their own currency, it becomes a problem for people to use it and um, to save it or maybe to make transactions with it. Well, those are the causes that uh, when we actually know inflation is coming, but sometime when we actually caught off guard, let's say, well, there are something unexpected happen in the economy and forces of high inflation. And those situations, it's what we call the unanticipated inflation. Well, unfortunately, um, in the case of unanticipated inflation, um, the social cost will be much higher than the one that we know is coming. Uh, for instance, uh, long-term commitments or contracts um, will be significantly affected by this kind of un unexpected inflation. Um, so for instance, when you are um, signing a wage contract, uh, with an employer. Let's say the employer agreed to you that um, they will give you a raise of 2% every year, um, and that would be the maximum. Um, when an unanticipated inflation happens, let's say the inflation happens um, in the economy that rises the overall prices by 10%, but in that same year, you're only getting a 2% adjustment from your employer. Um, obviously, the money that you are going to get or receive um, during this period is not comparable to the change of prices. So your purchasing power, power will uh, significantly reduce in this case. And also, um, think about uh, mortgage loan, uh, especially for bank. Um, when bank actually uh, um, making a mortgage loan to the households, households take the loan and they agree to pay a fixed rate, let's say, maybe uh, uh, 2% um, annually um, right, for the mortgage payments. Um, when the fixed rate is fixed in the contract, um, the problem is when inflation happens, um, that will actually make a very big impact to the uh, lender and the borrowers in the market. In particular case, when the bank actually receives your money and they know that inflation go up very, very high, let's say 10%, but they only get 2% additional in return from interest. Um, obviously, the money that the bank received from uh, the households um, during a high inflation period uh, will be losing the purchasing power of the money. So the bank in this case, the, the lender in this case, will actually uh, uh, be in the in favorite part. Uh, in the transactions. So this is a very, very general problem that we know. Um, uh, borrowers and lenders are going to be uh, very, very um, um, fragile to any change of prices. Um, the reason is because uh, whenever inflation goes in um, to the economy or whenever there is a deflation, um, either one way or the other, um, someone will ultimately get hurt. So during a high inflation period, usually the lender who received this um, fixed um, interest rates payment uh, will be uh, losing uh, in the case. However, in the deflation uh, case, when the economy actually has a uh, drop in prices, um, usually is the borrowers, um, the people who borrow money, will have to bear a heavier cost to pay back to their money because every, month, uh, every dollar that they pay um, back to the um, adapters um, are going to worth more um, to buy more goods and services in the economy. Well, generally speaking, um, those are the um, uh, things that we actually um, uh, concerned um, when uh, inflation or deflation actually happens um, in the economy. But more importantly, um, deflation is the one that we concern the most. And the reason is because whenever um, deflation happens, um, the overall price drops, um, most likely people will try to buy more when prices drop. But the problem is when people looking at the current prices, uh, it's so low, 
and they are expecting the prices will keep dropping, um, this is the point of time when the consumptions or the spending in the economy uh, will stiffen uh, even further. Um, people will wait and see well, how, when they are going to make purchase of some of this um, excess in the, in the economy. Um, they, if they know the prices are going to keep falling, uh, if they know the housing prices is going to keep dropping, um, they're probably going to wait and not making a purchase and spending money in the economy um, as they did before. Um, so that's why, well, the general uh, rule of thumb is when there is a deflation happens, usually the consumptions or general spending in the economy will reduce significantly. And at the same time, um, the burden of the borrower will increase during the deflations and making the households even harder to pay back to uh, their, uh, the mortgage payments or the, the loans. <clears throat> so in order to uh, look at the inf uh, interest rate or inflation rate, um, you also can uh, look into this equation here. Um, uh, remember, uh, not only wages or GDP can be calculated by real uh, variables. Um, interest rate is basically another uh, term that's very uh, usually popped up, popped up in uh, the study of economics. So in um, this case, um, you can actually imagine um, when someone borrowing money or lending money in the economy, um, they always try to look into interest rate uh, because the interest rate is usually the benefits for the lender to receive and uh, interest rate also is the cost for the borrowers uh, to pay for uh, borrowing the money. However, um, nominal interest rates um, is the term that we described what you actually see in the current date of the economy. Um, so for instance, let's say you walk across a bank and the bank actually posts this uh, 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 posters uh, at the front door and saying that uh, they will uh, actually offer a 10% uh, interest rates uh, to the saving programs. Um, so those interest rates reported by the uh, lender or the borrowers are basically the ones uh, we call nominal interest rates. And uh, when we try to get uh, the interest rate that we can compare across time, we usually use a term called real interest rate. So the real interest rate, again, the real variable are the ones that adjust for any price change in the economy. And in this case, uh, the real interest rate is calculated by the nominal interest rates minus the inflation rates in the economy. So for example, we have one right here. Suppose you can buy a cheeseburger at a price of $5 in 2014. So instead of spending your money um, of total $100 on cheeseburger in 2014, you choose to lend out for one year for interest payment of 10% in returns. After a year, you receive $110. However, at that point of time, the price of the cheeseburger now is $10. So now you want to think about what you're getting from your investments. Uh, it's 10% additional, but the inflation actually go up by double the price of the cheeseburger, which is 100%. So in this case, well, even though you are getting more money in return from lending the money, but when you, by the time when you reach, uh, receive the $110, um, you know that the $110 purchasing power in the, uh, in the year of 2015 uh, will be much lower than the $100 that you have in the 2014, because in 2014, you can actually buy a total of 20 cheeseburger. But in the year of 2015, one year later, with the interest payment return, the $110 can only buy you 11 cheeseburger. So in this case, obviously, the purchasing power reduced significantly. And that means your real return, the real interest rates that you're getting, is uh, much less than um, you expected to get. Um, so whenever we are considering um, to make a loan or uh, to borrow money, um, we almost never actually uh, think about the term nominal interest rate, but most of the time uh, we should um, always think about using the real interest rate to evaluate whether uh, a loan is worth for us to um, 
to take out or, or to borrow it uh, at any given point of time in the economy. So finally, um, we actually have this graph in the book, um, just kind of like give you an idea about the um, uh, the path of the real interest rate and nominal interest rates. Um, and as you can see, um, most of the time, um, after the year of 1982-83, um, the trends of the nominal interest rate and real interest rates are almost uh, uh, cynical. Yeah, they're almost uh, identical. They're, they are basically following the same directions um, every time. Um, so there is a, a reason for that, but of course um, you can imagine well, what it means because um, whenever you have um, uh, the nominal interest rates and you subtract uh, the real interest rates, um, you actually see the gap between the two. Uh, the gap between the two basically represents the inflation rates um, in the economy. So again, um, just like a rule of thumb, um, nominal interest rate is approximately as the interest rate on a three month US Treasury bill. The inflation rate usually it's measured by the change in the CPI in the United States. The real interest rate usually is calculated by using the nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate, which is the change in the percentage change in CPI, uh, which is the inflation rate, and also um, the interest rates on the three months U.S. Treasury bills. The real interest rate provides a better measure for the firm. Um, to make the decisions, whether they should um, increase the price, decrease the price, whether they should borrow the funding to invest or to buy a new factory firms or to buy new machines. Um, so it's a very, very important um, uh, variable that the, uh, the firms would like to uh, consider. When deflation occurs, uh, we will see the nominal interest rate will be less than the real interest rates. So in this chapter, we um, actually cover um, uh, quite a lot on the employment topics and also um, some of these uh, topics in inflation rates. Um, again, well, those are the general um, understanding of the indicators in the macroeconomic study. Uh, we are going to move on to the theoretical uh, models starting next chapter. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me. But um, I think uh, we will have um, at the end of the videos now and I will keep you guys updated if there is any um, uh, news um, about the online lectures uh, in the future. I will soon to see you next video.